let's go back if we can to the nine month break in 1989 and the nine shows in Europe which broke the fast if you will um you know what do you remember of the band cranking back into action at that time I can't be too specific about that um like, you know, that month to that month, or if there, we had a break, I don't remember anything being a break. Um, you know, really, I don't think it could ever been a described any, any period of more than seven or nine days from 1986 to 1990 for me, uh, that there would be a break for a week at a time, maybe, you know, but there was always something going on. I jumped on that train that was moving. It was taking a brief stop that was unexpected, but it was, ready to fucking catch its momentum again and it's, you know, locomotion again. Everything was spinning pretty fast. I was still quite excited about every damn thing that was happening. I wanted to do my best. I don't remember too much of a break. I remember all the touring going through the justice thing that being successful, the one, you know, shoot like shooting the videos and doing this and being on award shows and having to do that photo session. And these, that was just, every day was full with something. Everything was connected to Metallica somehow each day. So there was never really, I don't remember, break as it were um i remember us being busy i remember uh the coming off of the justice thing um and how good the record did everybody feeling really good about it coming home and getting i think everybody might have got like their first house and stuff you know we got our first real checks Mm -hmm. so i remember that happening and being home for a minute to try to do that um then getting back to as far as when the tour started and where we started with that and what time of the year or anything, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, unless you showed me the dates, I wouldn't yeah. be able to pull that back and tell you what time of year we started anything. I just remember it going, 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 and my sleep being all over the place and being so excited about life, man. That's what I remember. Let's, I mean, and the riff tape, uh, the, the fabled riff tapes that happen and that come together, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, what, yeah. what, what, do you, what do you remember of the riff tapes that were coming together on the Justice Tour? Obviously, you know, that was such a huge uh, period of time in terms of your sort of awakening, adjustment. Um, I think we've discussed before, it was not always the easiest of times uh, right. in many respects. and But yet you were also incredibly excited just to be there so there's this juxtapose yeah. you know what do you remember of the riff tapes and, and 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 you know how those got contributed to and 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 what you were contributing yeah so i was learning their um rules as it were or their formulas because uh, we had only recording wise we had only messed with live stuff as we're you know, record these ideas and, and stuff on your own or with the band and get, get a tape and there would be something that James and Lars were doing real quick. And so those became some riff tapes. I had only recorded the Garage Days thing with them and that was other people's songs. And so we hadn't really done a thing where this is how Metallica does it in the studio. James and Lars get tapes. You know, you put your riffs on your ideas on the tape that all got put in the pile like you've heard a million times. And then those guys pull out and they take an idea, take an idea, take an idea and try to build it into a blossom of some kind with our help once they've got the seed going. So I made up a couple of riff tapes with half done songs. Um, I wouldn't have put guitar tracks on yet. I wouldn't have even put click on. I wouldn't have put anything. It would just be the bass going or whatever. So I didn't know yet about the full or at least half realized ideas to give them first chorus, middle eight or something like that. You know, even, even though Metallica songs were never really like first chorus, middle eight type stuff. Um, still just that, sure, that general mean. idea of, of song arrangement and composition would not have been here yet to be able to share with mm-hmm. them. All I could do was give them an idea and a riff that would become something else later. That's what I remember. Right. And do you think, I mean, let's, I mean, let me ask you this. And this is, um, again, that we talk, we have talked in the past about, you know, there was suffering on the Justice album. Do you think that, uh, you know, the residual, were there any residual effects that came from that suffering as the Black album was coming, you know, to be written and coming together? Um, do you think that it was almost like you went through an audition and you passed? I mean, was there more recognition from everyone else when it came to your sound and involvement mm. as those Black album sessions were starting to, to, to come together did it feel different did you feel you'd passed an apprenticeship it definitely felt different um like you know the trial by fire is well documented and we really have to remember that there was 
so much more joy and excitement and feeling of accomplishment. And, you know, I'm so eager to please and willing to be a part of everything that I possibly can and give my all to it and all, you know, those things. So uh, they saw that. I think that was quite apparent from very early on that I was willing to go through whatever it took, whether it was from them or whoever or whatever, you know, I was willing to play my part in their outfit to help them make it happen from that time. So that part definitely felt different. I had proved myself on the road. It would get super sick and still go play anyway. You know, this thing you have to do, the things you got to do to prove yourself in that kind of a club. And I did. And so going into that, um, I felt better. I felt more confident. I was way feeling way better about the positioning of my bass in the orchestra, you know, that type of thing. And I was ready for Bob to show me how, what it really took. I was ready for it. And he was right there to tell me it. I had made, hadn't hit that point as my um, comprehension of bass. You know, I never let my chops go. I always kept playing. I always practiced. I always tried, you know, never wanted to be off when those guys asked me to play something, man. I'm right there, man. I, we're not messing around. No questions. Just fuck yeah, I got it. So that was super important. So I knew that going in, that's how I was going to do it. The only thing I would say was most noticeable that you of course have noticed by now was the posturing. There had to be that certain posturing. You got these egos of this already accomplished unit as Metallica. You had the individual posturing of Lars and James inside that, right? As that thing. And, first album that says co-produced by Hetfield or what, I mean, Ulrich, I'm something like that. You know, how they started getting to that place because Bob's coming in posturing with his ego and his accomplishments. <laughs> so we got the inners, the inners of the, of the, you know what I mean? Inner workings of the big workings, posturing for the potential. Everybody knows the potential. Like Master of Puppets did this. Holy fuck what it did to the real authentic people that want to hear that shit, man. That took set everybody on fire that knew better. Right? That posture for a justice they had. And because of the thing with Cliff, there was so much focus on what was going to happen with this incredibly well, promising band. And then they knew that. So Justice did really good. And the tour did even better. And the record sold like holy crap, even though it was going so fast and sounded like that. Uh, it had one on it. And then the video came and so it blew up. And so what's going to happen next? They can only go forward. They can only go up. So let's invest all this money in this producer, give them a point or two on the fucking record and then pull in the, these other guys and this student, this professional thing and rent out the most expensive studio you can to Los Angeles for nine months. And you know, whatever the hell all went down, right? Posture, 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 posture. And then it had to work itself out inside the walls, inside the four foot thick walls. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you've already hit the point where I was. Uh, I mean, and, and and just for the record, I had a a jogger point here, which said, you know, not how wonderful do you remember one on one being. Uh, my 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 phrase was how torturous do you remember one on one being. I, I noted that there was a punching bag there, which I remember. Oh, right here. That's was right. it regularly employed? <laughs> as one might have assumed, where did the main tensions lie? I mean, I think you very clearly articulated where the tensions were because you've got you know, the various posturings. I mean, it's, 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 it's really well articulated. And I remember, I remember it, you know, in myself, but witnessing yeah. it, let's put you right in the middle of that. And let's, let's address your role in that because there's got to be at that point, you've, you must be developing a sense of, well, I better have a bit of a posture myself here. Otherwise I'm going to get steamrolled by postures left, right and center. Um, so, so talk about those early days being in this, like, you know, bizarre goldfish bowl if you will of one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. and, and and your relation to the posturing and those you know the early the early tensions building how you dealt with those i was still um figuring out my role in the band and i think we've talked about that a couple times before in our in our time um how important the roles in the band were for it to all go around, you know, the four faces, the four images that represent Metallica and then all the people underneath it to the support system, what my role was in all of that integration, like, you know, where do I fit as the new guy in this? You still, no matter what, you're always going to be earning your way. No matter what, dude, the, the shoes will never be filled, bro. You just got to be yourself, play the best you can, be on point, be aware, be available when they call you out, pay attention to what Bob is saying. You know, this kind of stuff. So I just, as usual, even, even though those earliest years, it changed as time went by, 
I became more outspoken. But in that time, it was so I knew how important it was too to make a good record and be there. But I also really wanted to be heard on this one. Okay, I really. So what do I need to do as this guy in the position I've been given? Right. I've been a millionaire for four or five years by then. Like, holy, you know what the fuck, dude? I'm coming in and I got my basis. I got my shit. I got my thing. I've proven myself there and there and there. Now, what can I do to make sure I don't get dissed in the mix? And the other thing, pay attention. They brought this guy in for a reason. They gave him a bunch of money for a reason. James and Lars are actually listening to what he says and hearing the end of his sentences. This means something. This means something. So pay attention. Pay attention and just be back here, bro. Be back here and be ready to turn it up when they want you to turn it up. That's it. That's where I came from, man. That's where I was finding out my role in the band. The other things with interviews and make a wishes and all the other things that you have to do as a member and ambassador, I kept that absolutely professional, always absolutely professional. But my priority was being there when we're supposed to be there. They would not see an empty chair or an empty position if I was involved, right? They wanted me in there for Lars's drum checks. I'll be there all fucking day and night. And I was just laying the same thing over and over and over and over and over. So he could get what he wanted to get. Okay. Sacrificing, whatever you want to call it. It was my job. And I like, could you have a better job, dude? You got a base. You're going in with the, your favorite band and the biggest band. You got a chance to go and you, the next tour is going to be even fucking bigger than the last one that blew your mind. You know? And you know, so I just, I sat there and tried, dude, I held on. It was a ride. I didn't know the rules yet. And especially with all this new stuff coming in where Bob was actually taking time. That's not good enough yet. You know, that type of thing, man, that was new for me to see with my boys. They got to say when it was good enough, usually before. 